This is the Mixed Martial Arts Beat for the fourth week of March 2014. Hello again everyone, I'm Ariel Hawani inside our New York City studio. Another week, another episode of the MMA Beat. And I'm being joined by three of my best buds in the business, three of the best in the business. Right here we've got Mike Chiapetta returning from FoxSports.com, Jeff Wagenheim from SportsIllustrated.com, and then the man with the hat in his usual spot, the corner of the table, Mr. Chuck Mindenhall. All right, guys, a lot to talk about this week. Let us get right into it. A few days removed from a Sunday night UFC, and the big news, of course, was Dan Henderson's comeback win over Shogun Hua. And uh, I guess I'll weigh in at the end, because I've already had a chance to weigh in on this earlier in the week. Dan Henderson, Shogun Hua, based on what they did in that fight, the damage they took and the damage they've, they've, they've absorbed throughout their career, do you care to see either man fight again? Well, of course I care. I, I, of course I'd be interested in watching the fight again. I mean, I, I'd watch two soccer moms fight over a parking spot. Wow. So I don't know if you I'm the, away. I don't know <laughs> if I'm like the you know person to ask that sort of question to. But from a from a perspective, when you're looking at their health and you're looking at their long term futures, I I see where you're coming from. I think that there is a case to be made, you know, that for the long term health of either guy, maybe it's it's time to think about. Uh, hanging it up. Again, I always say when it, when it comes to guys like these, they deserve the right to sure. write their own endings, right? I mean, nobody should force them out. Um, they should fight until they're, they're, they're ready to hang it up. But at the same time, we've seen, you know, with Dan Henderson, he was knocked down twice in this fight. He was knocked out in, in the Belfort fight. It looks like, you know, he's kind of reached that stage where uh, he's not able to take the punches quite as well as he used to. And you know the guy had a granite chin. You know he, you're only able to take so many. Um, with Shogun too, you know he's been robbed of some of his agility with his all his knee issues. He's had some you know other health issues in the past few years. I, I would not be opposed to either either guy hanging it up. But again, we let them write their own ending. I'm not a fan of journalists kind of pushing guys out the door, especially legends. Um, but but I'm curious to hear what you have to say about it because. It, it almost feels uncomfortable at this point to see guys who have been through so much continue to take that kind of damage. Especially guys who are at the uppermost, or were at the uppermost level of the sport and were, were champions. And now you see them in a, in a different mode. And they, you know, they still sort of show the stuff of champion. I mean, the Henderson's comeback was pretty amazing. Really, even Shogun's, because Shogun got rocked and he fought back and he turned the tide. But, um, you know, I'm sorry with Mike on this. I, I, I'm not gonna say, no more, because they both showed, you know, the metal. They still have it, but where do they go? Are they, you know, they, you know, Henderson talked afterward about still making another run of the title. Is, is that realistic? I mean, in his mind, it is, but is it in the larger picture? But the thing is, it's, it ultimately is his decision. And unless he suffers so much damage that the UFC talks to him the way they sort of talk to Chuck Liddell, um, what, what are they going to do? They're going to they're going to put him in another fight, but what kind of fight? You know. What year is this right now? It's 2014? Yes. Back in 2007, <laughs> I was at, it was right after Dan Henderson fought uh, Quentin Rampage Jackson. He'd come over from Pride. He lost that fight. There was a, the, he was, his next fight was going to be against Anderson Silva. This is when I first was, had, was hanging around Henderson at his camp in California. I was doing all this stuff. There was a lot of whispering at that time. He's 37 years. This guy just turned 37 years. How much more can he do? You know, he's, you know, if he loses this fight, is it pretty much over? Is this going to be it? Here we are, six years later, having this discussion again. He's had, you know, he's winning. He beat Fajal for the belt. He beat Fedor Emelianenko. He's beat uh, Hua a couple of times. It's one of those things where you watch him and you, you, you sort of marvel at what he's been able to do. To me, there was no better example than that than this fight where he's dropped twice in a fight where we never know how these guys are going to respond after they're knocked out. Uh, like he was, it was his first time in his career he'd been knocked out. Mm. How is he going to respond? A lot of guys. You know, they, 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 that black spot has developed at that point. You know, they take a punch like that, they're, they're gone. If I'd seen that in this particular fight, I would definitely be in that corner. I'd be like, you know what? Dan Henderson, he just got knocked out twice in a row. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that maybe it is time to move on. But he, it was fairly miraculous for him to sort of stand up and, and then deliver that punch in the end. And, you know, in 90-degree weather, humid, all that stuff. Right. It's just, the guy's a warrior. I just can't imagine that he's going to actually walk away after something like that. Uh, to me, do, do I want to see him do it? I don't know. To me, I, I could see the storybook ending, like he knocks a guy out, hey, so long, it's been fun, I'm going out on a win streak. But at the same time, I don't think he's going to do it. That would be the great ending for Dan Anderson, like the cowboy ending. Not would be walk off, knock out, yeah. go off into the sunset. Yeah. But these guys are like too courageous for their own good. I mean, it's, it's been, you know, mirrored in their fight style all these years. That's why these guys made two such incredible fights. 
you know, when the, when the going gets tough, I mean, neither of them backs down. They just plant their feet and they do what they got to do. And that's it. And you just feel like that's how their careers are going to go forward as well. And I don't think either guy is going to, you know, let himself be dra- He's going to have to be dragged off, essentially, right? And neither guy is going to want to just voluntarily yeah. walk off. This is also that, you know, that goes back to that study that, um, you know, the UFC uh, talked about. And, and actually, the, the thing they collaborated with, they're collaborating with boxing and the right. Cleveland Clinic. And they're going to be studying, <laughs> they're studying uh, concussions and head, head injury and all that. You know they're they're going to be studying all these all this data, but the one piece of data that that it's sort of hard to grab a hold of is that sort of that mindset and 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 how much when is enough enough? You know when when a fighter gets hit because of that because they're a fighter they want to fight back and so it's it's hard for them to know when it's not when enough is enough and there's nobody outside of them to say enough is enough unless it's you know. I mentioned, you know, Chuck Liddell earlier. Well, I, I suspect that the, one of the reasons why he got out of the game when he when he did is because Dana White loves him. He's a really they're, they're good buddies. He would have stuck around if Dana White didn't yeah. give right. him that so, job. Until. And so this is a guy who he had a personal relationship with, sure. him, and Dana had a really big stake because this is a guy he really loves and cares about. Well, that's not enough for the sport as a whole. There has to be some way in right. which we can measure. Uh, or not measure, but somehow, I don't know, legislate or somehow determine whether these guys belong in there again, again and again and again. It, and this doesn't mean all that much, but it's amazing after the damage he took that Henderson wasn't even medically suspended. Right. I mean, you can make a case for the fight it's ending. He's to fight Machida afterward. Yeah. Right. You can make, <laughs> like, uh, you know, what, uh, a month or so later. Yeah. And you can make a case for that fight ending in the first round. Yeah. Um, Herb Dean let it go. and. Henderson wins the fight, but I couldn't help but think even before the fight, they were showing Dan Henderson shadow box in the locker room, and it's like he can hardly move. He can't move <laughs> his neck. He moves his entire body to try to you know, slip punches, sort of. It doesn't really do much of that these days. And I just couldn't help but feel after the fight, wow, that was amazing. I don't want to see him fight again. You see, something happens when these guys get locked in that cage, right? It's, it's, there's something where, yeah, you see them, and. It's like at some points when they're training and stuff, it's almost like they look robotic because sure. they've had so much mm. trauma to their bodies over the course of their lives. When they get locked in the cage, it's just different, man. It's, I don't know if it's the just primal thing where they flip a switch and it's the adrenaline and it's all about survival. I don't know what it is, but you see all the great ones have. That's why I always say, like every great fighter always has that like one last great moment. Yeah. This would be it. Yeah. It would be perfect. It, it, maybe, but he might have you another want, one. I mean, he's... A, like, I think Brian, Brian Stan had a great call that, that night, R- literally right before the knockout. Henderson was getting, you know, beaten pretty thoroughly, and he was just like, he's always got that, you know, TNT in his right hand or whatever he said. I don't remember exactly what it was. Literally two, two seconds before that punch. So that's, Dan, that's always going to be Dan Henderson when he's, in the, you know, when he's fighting. You know, he's always going to just have that one, you know, the H-bomb yeah. is always just a trigger away, man. And also, mm-hmm. truthfully, when you look at Dan Henderson, you go back a couple years, and he's sort of been that stiff presence like you are mentioning True. in a few of his fights. I remember the Fajal one where he's kind of wading in there, and he got hit pretty good in that one and dropped momentarily in that fight as well. He didn't want to fight against uh, Fedor. He didn't want to have a gunfight with Fedor. I mean, he goes out there and swings with him right away. It's really more of a, almost a mentality thing. Yeah. Like he's, He goes in there, and he wants to, you know, everybody knows he can wrestle. He, he did a lot of that. He preserved his chin for a long time in pride, you know, just kind of, he didn't take... Some of the punishment, like maybe Vonderlei did, or right. some of these guys. You know, he was able to kind of persevere a lot longer than that. Um, but it's it's in his mind. I think uh, he got criticized a little bit on that Anderson Silva fight about you know he took him down and then he wanted to swing the, because that's just his mentality. He wants to go in there and put on a show as well. And I think as he goes along, it's just kind of nuts. But he's 43 years old. He'll be 44 in August. He still wants to do that. He still wants to go in there and just test guys' chins and knock them out. Yeah. And you know, he'll take some. He, it's just it's a dangerous way to be at that age or at any age, really. But it's almost like he's gotten more reckless as time has went on. I wonder if he wants to like try and pass Randy's record of being the oldest guy to Could fight be. in the UFC. I mean, there, there might you know there might be some interest in that as well. You know, I'm sure he wants to make a run of the title, but there's also something to be said to be like the last guy standing that I'm 46, 47 years old and I'm still able to compete what with is these guys. What's his contract for? Four fights? Like 30, well, he has five, five more. Five, five more. So guys just by the end of that yeah. five fights, I'm expecting to fight John Jones. The, we'll have a big, the, big time. Right. The That's last right. of the gunfighters. Like, like you were saying, like in 2008 yeah. when you fought Anderson, you know, there's whispers. You know, how much more does he? Have? Right. It's six years later. Maybe I we know. should revisit this in 2020. So what about show? Shogun versus Henderson. Do you want to see a third fight? No. Okay. <laughs> you don't want to, because, you know, after the, the, no, the I fight, don't. <laughs> uh, Chael Sonnen was, you know, campaigning for it. It seemed like a lot of people said, why not? You know, you know even they, though he's 2-0. Oh. They gave us so much. Really, they gave us yeah. so much in that first one yeah. that I, I remember going into the second one, I was like, oh, man, you know, I, I sort of want to see it, but 
but I'm almost afraid it's not going to live up. And in some ways it didn't live up, but in other ways it did because it, we, saw, it was pretty amazing. They, yeah. the, uh, you know, these, the one guy gets, gets knocked down and then and knocks the other one down and almost finishes him. But that, and Henderson's survival at the end of the first round, albeit only in the last 20, 25 seconds he had to last, that was pretty amazing because, you know, he was... He looked like he was stiffened at the end of that round, and he somehow mm. knew that Herb Dean was, was going to pounce, and he knew he had to move, which was a good lesson for other fighters to know that you can't just stay there. you got you got to move. Mm. But it was almost like he's, you know, he's too good for his own good. Some of the other fighters, you, how many times do you see a guy get knocked out and then protest, and, sure. and you know, he wants to get up and fight some more? It's just, it's just part of what these guys do, and the, and the really good ones who almost get knocked out but don't get knocked out in a way, that sort of works against them. He was only deemed up a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> he said just a tad. Yeah, just right? a tad. He's like he's he's MMA's John Wayne. He really he is. is. He comes in he there really with that uh, camo I, I, hat. He, he's all you know, calm, cool, yeah. collected. It's interesting that we're focusing on Henderson here. What about the guy who right. lost? The guy who had his nose rearranged. I mean, he's clearly not the same Shogun. And I want to be clear. I'm not. I don't want to disrespect them because I have the utmost respect oh, for course, those guys in particular. How could you not after watching that? So you don't want to. You know, it's not that I don't. Of course, if they fight again, I'll watch. It's and out be of interested. concern for his, yes. It's out of yes. concern for both of them, and at this point, you know how much how much is there left to, to, to strive for and to fight for? It just it, in some it's ways those... you worry more about Shogun. He's like a decade, totally. you know, he's like ten years younger, but um, he's been through a lot more like, really big wars, I think, than Dan Henderson. And you know, you look at just his recent trajectory, some of those fights he's had. It's just I don't know. There's something about him I feel like that's slipping off more. You know, Dan Henderson had a couple of split decision losses where he didn't take a lot of damage recently, um, but I feel like Shogun each time really gets in there and it's it's a it's a fight. And you mentioned John Wayne. It's almost as though for both these guys to an extent, they're they're becoming the embodiment of some John Wayne movie where there's the aging gunslinger and all the young guns. You know, if you're a young MMA fighter and you're a, a light heavyweight or maybe even a middleweight. Yeah, you, I want to fight Shogun. I want to fight Henderson because if I can put on my record, I defeated one of those guys and knocked one mm. of those guys out. That's a that's a really good thing. Even though the guy's you know older and and has been bumped up bumped around a lot, so you know th that adds a whole other level. And these guys are gonna they're gonna take those challenges because they're fighters. And the quandary becomes too like who do you even match Dan Henderson? That's really where I'm. True. Who who would you even like put Fabio Dan Henderson? Fabio Maldonado yeah. is, is, is right. That's like is that. there there's guys like that. He's it's still like really a middleweight. Yeah. I mean, didn't he weigh in at 202 or something? Was yeah, he did. 202. It's like two. <laughs> he's an, yeah. that, that's what, Who wants to cut that? How weight incredibly at that age? tough is this guy? Yeah. He's, he's still fighting. He's 43 years old. He's still fighting guys bigger than he's done in his whole career. He fought heavyweights. He fought. He's, he's unbelievable, man. He's yeah, guy, chug water. That's, that's why it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to put anything past him. The guy could go sure. out and win four fights in a row. But, you know, and I'm sure, you know, there's, we, we, of course, it's out of concern for his future well-being and everything. I'm sure there's people in his life that love him and, and are going to tell him that, you know, that are going to be honest and be, you know, we're, we're worried about you. You know, you've, you've been knocked out. You've been knocked down. But at the end of the day, you know, that's what, that's what these guys are. They're fighters, man. It's hard to take the fighter out of the man. While we're talking about the light heavyweight division reports this week that the UFC is considering booking Daniel Cormier versus Rafael Feijal Cavalcante on the July 5th card, surprising because most of us thought they would wait to see what happened between Anthony Johnson and Phil Davis next month in Baltimore. And that would be a natural number one contender fight after Gustafson fights the winner of Jones versus Glover Teixeira. What do you make of this? this matchmaking, this potential matchmaking, for Cormier, a guy who, of course, was going to fight Rashad Evans in February, he gets injured, fights Patrick Cummins, wins that fight very easily, and now fights a guy not in the top 10. Some criticizing the matchmaking, maybe even criticizing Daniel Cormier for taking this fight. What do you make of it? That division is very tough for me to figure out in general. Like, you just look at that whole division, and it's it's strange, because John Jones, it's like, it's a unique situation. John Jones came in, and he really cleaned house immediately. You know, he put himself up there. So then you're like, you get a short list of guys who can then challenge him. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you get a guy like Gustafson, obviously, who comes in and, and almost beats him. So this becomes the novelty. Well, he's a, this is his, his, his rivalry. So... He does what he's supposed to to get back to that fight, right? Um, Glover Teixeira is already up there. What are, so it's like the picture is sort of clear at the top. Daniel Cormier is sort of in a gray area. I feel like he's just not, you know, he beat Patrick Cummins, who um, I think he was ranked. What, what did you have him with? Was, uh, <laughs> but he, yeah, it was about 27. <laughs> really? wow. But he beats Patrick Cummins in his, you know, he looked great in his debut. I don't know how much you can take from that. In some ways, I, I, can, I can sort of see it. It doesn't make complete sense to fight a guy who's 13 in the rankings, for the UFC rankings, 
But there's, I don't really know who you put him against. Uh, you know, who else is out there? He's going to have to fight somebody. But what about Rumble and Phil Davis? To me, mm-hmm. this this speaks to the fact that the UFC is no longer really matchmaking. They're trying to, you know, plug holes. That fight that's, is in a month. Just right, wait for that true. fight to play out. That's the fight that makes sense. What are you doing with this other fight? You were one of the people who felt as though Cormier had was deserving of a title shot Absolutely. just based upon what he did as heavyweight. Yeah. And I and I've always advocated for him doing something at light heavyweight. And I don't consider beating Patrick Cummins doing something. I don't feel I feel that was just, you know, a payday that they needed to they, they gave him his payday and he was fighting a guy who, you know, was was pouring coffee a week late, a week earlier. <laughs> Um, so now it's time. Okay, let's now let's put him in a challenge with with a guy who's in the top top ten. The fight that you're talking about would be would be pretty awesome. I mean, I, I don't. Yeah. I think it'd be be great to see that fight if they put him in against a guy who's you know the UFC now has their rankings. They expanded to top to a top fifteen, and I think the Fejia was like fourteen or fifteen. Thirteen. Now. Thirteen. Yeah. Okay. So How about moving that? On up. Did you just move up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think they moved them up yesterday <laughs> when they talked about this. Or Maybe. Something. But um, you know, put him in a guy who's not in the top ten. What does it prove? What is, is it just another payday? I mean, it's a, more of a challenge maybe than fighting like, fit. It's fighting like you a said, hole. That's exactly There's no question. There's no question it's plugging a hole. And they've done this for a long time. Sure. I mean, unfortunately, the schedule is the way it is. Once they plug in those dates, they, they have to be filled. They're, right. they're, mm-hmm. There's product, and they have to move the product, right? So, yeah. unfortunately, that's, that's the way it is. That's it, the new reality, more, more so than ever, is. right? Probably. I mean, the fact of the matter is how many, there, there's going to be 50 shows this year. Um, there's going to be situations like that to come up where they say, Oh, okay, darn, we got this show now. What do we do? Yeah. You know, uh, this guy's injured. I mean, we got all these champions injured. Who, you know, we have to have some big names in there, right? right. Yeah, Daniel Cormier, Cormier is available. Okay, who can we plug him in with? And unfortunately, sometimes it's going to be matchups that don't really make sense in terms of the title picture. Now, the question is, you know, when, when Cormier came, moved from heavyweight to light heavyweight, a lot of people thought, hey, he can move right into a title shot. Now that he's come in and he's fought Patrick Cummins and maybe he'll fight Fajal. Does it feel like that's a, a proper, like, you know, going up the ladder towards the champion? It's, it's just bizarre. It's yeah. small, so I, I don't small. know. Like, is that, is that a better thing for he him? He was so close know. to that title shot. I know. It's anyway. almost like he's getting uh, further away. And, and just because he didn't want to fight I don't his friend. Maybe to be seen what happens. It's not, it's not official. Who knows? Maybe Dan Henderson comes in and saves the day and fights uh, uh, Daniel Cormier. You would want to see I'm that? Not sure. Oh, man. <laughs> what about <laughs> Henderson? Like, Daniel, you were retiring two minutes ago. A lot of people don't like that matchup for Henderson, but Henderson beat Fajal just a couple years ago. It's like, in some ways, you're like, well... <laughs> so the other big story that happened over the weekend, right before the Fight Night show on Sunday, um, Bleacher Report comes out with this story about Will Chope, about his troubled past in the Air Force, um, you know, five months in, uh, in confinement, uh, accused of verbally and physically assaulting his now ex-wife. This comes out on a Saturday night, Sunday morning, the UFC reacts pulls his fight against Diego Brandao from the card and then releases him. They don't actually tell him he's released. He actually finds out the news from John Anik and Brian Stan at the <laughs> UFC office in Brazil, which is, I guess, another story for a different day. But he is no longer a part of the UFC after fighting for them yeah. in January. Right. What do you make of this decision, especially considering the fact that this, this incident or incidents happened in 2009? Well, I, I guess from well, PR perspective, I could understand the decision they made. No corporations like bad publicity, and that's bad publicity for them, especially when they're they're, they're always fighting that sanctioning battle when they go into new places. Um, but you know, looking at it from like so, like a human standpoint, I would say you know I would have preferred for them to say, okay, we're going to pull this this fight, um, and then like investigate this further. I don't know if they they ever did any of that other than reading you know the story that came out about it. Um, it was, you know, it was several years ago. I'm not, I'm not trying to say, you know, Will Chill necessarily deserves a second chance. I'm just saying I think it would have been the responsible thing to do to look into it further. I think he was like 18 or 19 years old at the time. Okay, granted, that's, that's old enough to be an adult, but a lot of 18, 19-year-olds do really stupid things. Um, so I don't think that should brand you for the rest of your life. Like, I think you should still be able to make a living. So, you know, maybe... That's the only thing I would have liked them to, to do. Really investigate it. Maybe they did. I don't know, but it didn't seem like there was time for it. Right. You know, in the, in the grand scheme, that that's the yeah. thing. Because you know, there's there's been they, they said that they don't. You know, the UFC will never stand for that. But you know, we do know that there's other guys on the roster. Uh, Abel Trujillo is one who right. has been right. who, who pled guilty to a domestic uh, abuse charge in the past, and he's on the roster. He's still active, and that's something that came out, I think, after he was already on the roster as well. So it's, it's a pretty similar you know, parallel, and one guy's on the roster and one's not. 
I, I know every case is different. They, they need to take every case one by one. I'm not saying that everything should be, you know, uh, you know that, that it would be nice if they had a policy. It would have been nice if they investigated it and, and made a decision based on, you know, the facts uh, and, and what this guy is now, five years later. Has he rehabilitated himself? Has he been in any kind of trouble? Yeah. Timing is everything, though. And, and when the UFC finds out about this the day before a scheduled fight, um, of course, they're going to act with. They're going to. They're going to use a shotgun to to just wreck everything and get rid of the guy. And and you talked about responsibility. Their responsibility. This uh, Will Chope's responsibility, in my mind, was to show us that he's moved beyond his past. You know, he talked in, in a MMA fighting interview about how you know he and his ex-wife are, have a better understanding, and they under, mm -hmm. and they both agree that that they both are that he's in a better place now. And and he, you know he spoke; he's very soft-spoken and sounded like a like he's moved on in that regard. Um, but he still needs to own up to his past. He still need and when he when he filled out a uh, the paperwork to take a UFC contract, and he saw a question about. Do you have a criminal record? And he then said, "Well, all this um, spousal abuse that I was convicted of back in uh, back five years ago, well, that turned out to be a misdemeanor and it wasn't a felony. So he checked no or just didn't check yes and didn't fill it. That was to me that was irresponsible. That was letting the that was essentially allowing the UFC to be blindsided. And so I don't blame them for, you know, for for shipping him off. And you're you're right. People do um, they grow. He was 18. He was 18. Now he's a little older. People do grow, but you know, our past doesn't really go away. Our past, we live with our past. If, if he had been a, let's say instead of that, that abuse, he had, been a, he had been a drunk driver and he killed somebody, that's the kind of thing that he would have been maybe in jail for the rest of his life. And, and that wouldn't go away just because at 23, he knew better. Our past stays with us. And I think that this was a case where, yeah, he deserves to live his life to the best, best he can, but he, does, he, doesn't, he doesn't deserve a UFC contract just because he's moved on, and if he's not going to be responsible enough to live, to to take uh, ownership of his past, then then I think the UFC did the right thing. I feel like you've got it with the blind side. I feel like that's what happened. They, the UFC was blindsided by it. They just didn't know about this, and you know, to, rather than have the negative publicity about it, you know, other than what they already got, they do something about it immediately. Just nip it in the bud right away and get rid of it. Um, I just want to see like some kind of, I, I'm not sure, where, it's always a case-by-case -case basis with UFC. You're never sure where everything really stands with them. Uh, it, one guy can get by with something, another guy could be dismissed from that. Um, we know that Alexander Gustafson, for instance, served time for something he did in the past. It was an assault charge, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, you know, we don't really talk about that because that's his, that's his past. He dealt with it. He, he served his time. Um, you remember Jeremy Stevens went through some similar things. The UFC backed him on this thing. There's, there's just all kinds of inconsistencies in there. I would love to see, like, there just be more of a uniform dealing with that sort of thing. It's a fight game. You yeah. know you're going to have that element in the fight game. It's going to happen. Yeah. A lot of guys come from different backgrounds. In any sport. In any sport. In, in, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But particularly the fight game, I mean, just boxing, you know, sure. there are criminals throughout boxing's history, everything else. So it, you, you just, you, it's, it's, Dana White has been very good about sort of giving guys second chances, rolling with the punches, to use that pun. But he, you know, there are certain ones where it's like a zero tolerance, and you're like, well, why is that guy zero tolerance versus this guy versus this guy? So you'd like to see some consistency there. I think everyone makes great points. I think you, you'd like to see them speak to the guy, do their due diligence, find out what exactly happened. You're right about being blindsided. And, and I think most importantly, you know, this has happened several times in the last couple of years where a story comes out on the internet about a guy's past and the UFC reacts. It happened on that Strike Force card a couple of years ago, happened here. I mean, it's happened, I could think of at least three or four cases. It, yeah. a Zufa fighter, mm -hmm. where this happens, that, that German fighter, Benjamin Brinza, stories come out right. about him, and, and they let him go. You want to see some, some, some background checks being right. done, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, and, and some of these things are hard to find out. The Brinza one may be a little more obscure, but you'd like to see thorough background checks being done, and if the UFC feels like this guy has changed, well then, you know, explain it to us. But it, it doesn't feel to me like they actually took the time to speak to him and find Even out exactly. with the Brinza case, I remember Dana saying, you know, we, we have guys looking into it. Like, they took time, and it took, it took a little they while until they, they actually released right them. They You're didn't right. cut them right away. So this case, for some reason, I, I guess, it, you know, probably that is. The, the, they were blindsided by disclosure. it, and they felt embarrassed. and The, the lack of disclosure, probably. And I mean, that's a fair, you know, yeah. that's a fair thing to say. But they did not say that. The, the, the release was just, you right. know, he has been exactly. cut because we have a zero tolerance policy. If they would have said it, he did and not they disclose have, it. They don't have a zero tolerance right. policy. That's, 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 that's not what true. I'm saying. So that's just a gray area. It would have been nice. <clears throat> um, for them to do that, and, and, and Will is, 
is still campaigning, although he has another fight. He's still campaigning. I have a feeling he's probably not going to get that. Resourceful, that though. He's already got yeah, his other fight. That's true. <laughs> right away. Um, another guy who was released for a completely different reason, but a man who has had his ups and downs in the UFC, Melvin Gallardo, very uh, popular fighter. Um, Dana White has stuck by him. I recall a, uh, a, a, post, a pre-fight press conference in Denver, UFC 135, when he talked about you know, Melvin and, and uh, how much he has been through and him just you know, getting it all together yeah, to realize that times. potential. Many yes, um, a guy who was on The Ultimate Fighter season two. He's been in the UFC for a very long time, has fought in some main events, some co-main events, and on Friday news comes out that he has been released. And uh, as is the case often with a somewhat popular fighter, the fans are up in arms. They, they say they'll never watch the UFC again. How could they do this? They did the same with Yushin Okami. I wonder how many of those fans are going to follow him this Saturday in his uh, World Series of Fighting debut. But what did you make of this decision, especially after you know that, that subpar performance <clears throat> against Michael Johnson just a couple weeks ago? Sports is performance based. Yeah, you know, in, in his last uh, five or six fights, he's won two. I think he's two five and two and five with one no contest. Is that right? Um, so. In a performance-based sport, in a performance-based field, that's not very good. Uh, and I know, you know, he's had, I think there's at least one split decision in there. He's had some decisions that could have gone his way, but unfortunately, that's just the way of the sports world. There's, there's always, there's always going to be an in with the old, out with the, uh, in with the new, out with yeah. the, whatever it is. Yeah, <laughs> Can one of those. Yeah, whatever that is. You know, yeah, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Unfortunately, he's just he's a victim of that. Where you know the roster has to turn over. He's he's had plenty of opportunities. To, he he did have that really nice five fight win streak a few years ago. Kind of moved into close getting into total contention. Never really just had the big signature win that could put him over the top into mm -hmm. the lightweight uh, title picture. And also was inconsistent at times. Yeah. You know there was all. Always, always issues with the ground game. Unfortunately, you know there was always people who said he's a little bit of a head case when he goes to the ground. He panics, um, and he, unfortunately, he just never kind of got over that hump. And when you're 30 years old, I get you, you, there, there's going to come a point where the UFC kind of takes a view of you. What, what, where are you? Where are you? Where are you going? In some ways, I mean, he was a journeyman, right? I mean, and that's mm -hmm. not that's not a knock on him. I mean, he was an exciting fighter. Um, he, he's capable of beating anybody with the power in his hands, but he just couldn't get over that hump. And at some point they say, okay, you had all, you had a lot of opportunity and you just didn't get there, so. Well, you, you also talk about him being excited, but you, you were talking about him and his, his most recent record and more losses than wins. And uh, I think he's one of those guys who transcends that a little bit with, because of his, his past of being <clears throat> an exciting guy who always brings it, but his last fight he didn't. His last fight, he was very sure. passive and he took some criticism afterward. And I think in a way that all of a sudden, that, that record of his that was that was almost hidden behind a curtain because he was always an exciting guy came out to the forefront because well if he's not going to be exciting then then we then what are we going to go on we got to go on whether he can win or lose and, mm -hmm. and because there are guys who can if you if, you know you could be boring but if you're but if you're winning every night you're going to probably stick around but if you're uh, but if you're not winning you better be damn exciting yeah even you if know? you're exciting though there's there's always going to be a limit of, of yeah. how far they'll keep i mean like leonard garcia there's always going to be a limit of, of of you know hey excitement only gets you so yeah. far and they'll hold on to you for a certain amount of time and it's like there's there's always going to be more exciting guys you know who are younger and cheaper yeah. and, and you know but there are different team. rules for different divisions right because if you're a light heavyweight or heavyweight sure. your leash is probably a little longer lightweight maybe yeah. the most there's crowded division guys, in the yeah. ufc he, he seems to me one of those guys who's always sort of shrouded in potential, like yeah. for, forever, as far, as far back as you're going. Wasn't he, I mean, he's on the, on the tough season that he was on. I mean, from that point onward, it seems like even before then, he's a potential guy. Like he's, he's one of those guys that potentially is going to run the division at some point, right? Like he's, he has that potential. We, the closest we got was during that five fight winning streak, but it was always like he was a little uh, messed up with his priorities. If you remember, he th that fight he fought Joe Lozon in Houston, and it was because it was in Houston where he was from. He wanted to just fight that fight. It was almost like he didn't put real thought into um, his he was, opponent he was as past much. That fight in his head. I remember him talking. Right. I, I was at that fight. I remember and him I talking about. And I think that's the biggest thing. Is he the just, belt. There's probably yeah. more to it. The UFC has dealt with him for a long, long time. Joe Silva's dealt with him for a long, long time. He's been from gym to gym to gym. I, you said journeyman. He's actually the classic. Definition of <laughs> a journeyman yeah. because he's yeah. he's right. been from gym to gym to gym. It's not like everybody he leaves is always like, oh, we miss Melvin. You know, there's a, there's a little bit of like, well, good riddance, you know, to Melvin. Um, 
yeah, he's a little excited, but I, I get the feeling that there's just more to it than just yeah. him, you know, coming in there and doing that. And there was particular disappointment in the build-up to this last fight with Michael Johnson. He just didn't perform, and obviously, like Dana White, it was pretty obvious afterwards that he was disappointed in that. You talk about him as being a guy with a lot of potential, and what is it that takes potential into achievement? Often, it's coaching. And if he's moving from camp right. to camp to camp, and is not, you know, it's sort of I don't know if burning bridges might be a little strong, but yeah. people behind him. Aren't that much? Aren't, aren't that much uh, too upset about seeing him leave? Then you know, he's not. He's not. A, he's not integrated in that coaching in a, in a real good way. So he really hasn't yeah. developed in a way that a guy who who sticks at one place and really sort of learns that craft. It just seems like he's the same fighter that he used to be, only not quite as exciting. All that stuff said. Nine-year run. In yeah, the yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. That's an achievement in itself. And yeah. he, regardless and he of what they want to tell like, him. He had some... Uh, the Cowboys surrounding fight in Denver you were mentioning, didn't he take that on? <laughs> wasn't that a short notice? Short notice, fight? yeah. I mean, there's, there were situations like that that, you know, it wasn't the most advantageous thing for him to do was to take that, but he still did it. And they end up as losses on his record. But if you remember, that round was pretty nutty. He had actually, yeah. you know, hurt Cerrone and the Cerrone right. won. So, I mean, he, to me, it's like, it's just one of those things. Um, there's probably a lot more to it going on and just dealing with him over the course of 20-some fights over the years, his inconsistency and, and, he, and who he is. And he took like a half, a glass half full approach to the news right. saying that, well, now I can go make more right. money, which I don't know. I mean, well, I'm not sure that that's where, yeah. where, how he's going to do that. But maybe, you know, we, we know that uh, Ben Askren took a lot of money to go to, go to Asia. So, but, and there's, he hasn't, uh, you know, hasn't like sort of uh, gone over there and made any of the camps over there be, uh, you know, ready to see him go. So maybe, maybe Melvin could do that. But I have a feeling he's gonna he's gonna try to hook on with one of the domestic uh, sure. uh, promotions. And I don't know. Is, is can you see him in one of those Bellator tournaments? Can you see I him? I could uh, see him in there. I could see him in World Series of Fighting. These mm -hmm. are the kind of names that those organizations go after. And um, while we're speaking of that, a, a name that has gone to World Series of Fighting is Husimar Palhares. He is making his WSOF oh. debut this Saturday. With He's an asterisk, this Saturday. he is fighting this Saturday. How about that? Um, <laughs> this Saturday, the more you know. We should say we're taping this on a Thursday afternoon. He has yet to pass the drug test that the Nevada State Athletic Commission has asked him to take. That news could come out at any point. Um, and and really, my my main question regarding Paul Harris is, was it fair for Nevada to to do this to World Series of Fighting? I mean, we've known about this fight for quite some time, and they asked him to take the test several weeks back, as far as I'm concerned, at least three weeks ago. He couldn't do it right away, had to come to Las Vegas last week, and it took, you know, or it will take 10 or so days for the results to come out. Is that fair to a promotion to leave them hanging? Now here we are, almost 48 hours before the fight, and we still don't know if the guy is licensed. The only answer here is who cares whether it's fair to the promotion. If you really want to clean up the sport, mm -hmm. then that doesn't matter. That's not a question that should even be, you know, posited. Um, a true random test, he would have, when they wanted to test him three weeks ago, that's when he would have been tested. Now, oh, right. wait, wait a week or two till I get to Las also Vegas. Also bizarre. Right. So that, that's a problem right off the bat. But um, if he couldn't get there or World Series of Fighting couldn't get him here, that's on them. They could have had the tr drug test results in a week or so ago, fair, fair. right? That's on them. That's not, that's not on the commission. And the commission, you know, obviously we live in a world where the, they're sort of intertwined. I mean, the commission is dependent upon the revenues that are generated by all these events for them to continue to exist and for them to do drug testing, all this stuff. And they have literally publicly said, you know, that they make considerations uh, um, based upon, you know, they want events to come to their state, right? So unfortunately there is sort of a conflict of interest there. I like the fact that they, they're saying, you know, oh, well, that's your main event. That's your problem, right? Mm -hmm. If he passes or whether he fails, that's your problem. That's what they should be doing. For drug testing to be effective, they shouldn't care about what's good for the promotion. That's not their, that should not be their concern at all. So I'm glad that they, that they did this, and, you know, we'll see. I mean, hopefully he passes it and they have their main event. And if he doesn't, oh, well, that's their problem. Random testing is random testing, so I agree with you there that, that you know, if they wanted to test him on during his walk out to the cage, you know, go back in there and pee, and that's, you know, that's fine. But I guess the thing that, I'm, that, that I think, if there's anything about fairness here, the idea that he has to uh, leave Brazil, where he's training, and come to Las Vegas two weeks before his fight, I, you know, I always think of, to me, a, a random test would be, you know, somebody comes and knocks on your door sure. when you're not expecting it, and, and they do your test. And it's not so much someone coming to knock on your door and saying, here's a, here's a letter telling you have to get on a plane and come to Vegas. I think that's the, the bigger 
issue. I wish that there were, the, as we create all this, this random test and we try to make that happen, I wish we could create something where, where, the, where commissions don't have to bring you into, they don't have to bring you into Las Vegas to do a test. They, they, you know, they, there are doctors and there are labs all around the world where these fighters That was can, the issue though, right? He didn't have anything or anyone near him. So the concession they made was come to Las Vegas. There was no lab. But there is a Brazil. Brazil any, any, he lives in a very within, remote part of Brazil. But there is a Brazilian commission there, right? right? right. They can work yes. in conjunction. Very bizarre. To make him go all the way to, to Las Vegas. Early, yeah. Because what, what, what's the purpose of, of, uh, of random testing? It's right. to get rid of performance enhancing drugs. It seems to me that making a guy break camp two weeks ahead of a fight and, and fly to Las Vegas is the opposite. It's like performance detracting drugs. It's, it's like making, a, it's like you know, ruining a guy's training at a time when they're, it's a pretty crucial time. And so suddenly, instead of you know, doing his last bit of training and sparring and all that stuff, He's flying off the base. Well, he brought this upon himself, though, right? Because yeah. he failed the test in the past. Sure. This is not like yeah. it just came out of left field but, for. A, he he's failed the test in the but, past. So. Yeah, but but that's but I don't know that this is that, that's that would be. So you, that's know, you have to jump through extra hoops. You have to jump through extra hoops. That's how it is. I mean, other guys who failed drug tests have to go through, you know, an extra hearing to get licensed or whatever the case may be. Sure. Unfortunately, that, unfortunately, he lives in a place that apparently is remote. I'm just I mean, wondering. it would be nice if there, somebody, you know, they could have gotten together with the Brazilian commission and of said, course. send us, send someone to take the sample or whatever the case may be. But that how didn't long happen. have we known about this fight? Even if they came to him three weeks ago, maybe Nevada should have come to Pajaros, and, and and maybe that that was their plan. We're gonna randomly test this guy three weeks out. Maybe that was the plan throughout. But we've known about this fight for at least a couple months now. Um, it, it just feels like to leave the promotion in limbo, I guess the, the word is unfair and this, this shouldn't be. <laughs> no. This, this shouldn't be a problem with the commission. I just think it's interesting with Usmar Paul Harris. It's like, it's which red flag do you want to focus on? Well, you know, he's got so many red flags hey, waving at once. It's like, uh, <laughs> it's one of those things, like, obviously this thing comes up, but it sort of detracts from the other thing about his fight, which is that, you know, he was banished from the UFC for holding on to these, True. these moves so long. Um, his whole thing is almost like a, a circus a little bit at this point. And I, I wonder, you know, you wonder, first off, if he fights, if he's able to fight, um, how much he'll be able to change these things because at this point I feel like he's sort of going off the rails a little bit it, it doesn't even matter um, so much about you know one thing versus the other versus it's all those things together I think he just he's, he carries this sort of black mark at this point and it sort of was why I wanted to see him uh, in this I wanted to see how it was handled it's just funny that now we've found a new sort of controversy to right. focus on rather how than Kusimar the old Paul one Paul Harris is the situation right, right? yeah <laughs> you know what I'm saying <laughs> one, yeah. more, one more day at camp the next day in camp he, he was scheduled to have a coach come in and teach him how to let go of a leg hold <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> but wouldn't you agree? At this point, he's he's kind of must see TV. You like, you just want to see oh, absolutely what he's going to do in there. I wanted to see him against Ben Askren so bad, only on the sense that Ben Askren had you know the guys he'd fought and his attitude versus Paul Harris, where he'd come from. It's sort of like you're, you'd be sticking these two uh, black guards against one another, you know, um, and plus the different elements of the ground. But uh, honestly, like there there's intrigue for me to see how much he's going because we've seen him. It's not just the holding of the heel hooks or you know these these moves uh, that he's done. Against Mike Pierce, etc. It's like you know Brazil at 134 when he jumps up and he thinks he's won the fight, and they, yeah. they have to tell him to get back down and keep fighting, or the Nate Mark fight. fight. I mean, there's just there's so many bizarre endings he's for like, this guy. He's like he's like MMA's Dennis Rodman. Like I fully <laughs> expect really him is. to come out like in a but feather he bow and lipstick. And I feel like he doesn't even realize <laughs> no, no. it. That's, well, I mean, everyone says like he's a very soft-spoken, sure. quiet, like shy, keep to himself kind of guy, but he. I don't know. He just generates this chaos around him. But, <laughs> go ahead. Well, I was going to say they, they always people always talk about how the fighter has a certain mindset once they you know the, the, the person that's outside the cage and they then they come into the cage and they're a whole different person. I don't know if there's anybody who embodies that <laughs> more than him because if you do listen to him talk and you know, I don't understand the the Portuguese, but you just listen to his his tone of voice when he's being interviewed. He is soft spoken. Yeah. He sounds and everybody who, who I've ever talked to always said he's a really nice man, yes. a real gentleman. <laughs> And then he gets in there, and it is like he is in a whole different altered state of consciousness. It's funny because Mike Pierce didn't say that nice thing. Yeah. <laughs> this fight, though, feels like um, a new chapter for WSOF because late last year they signed Balharis, they signed Okami, and they, they seem to be that place, and they tried to sign Ben Askren, that place where they're going to sign these UFC cast-offs, maybe the ones that Bellator doesn't want for whatever reason, and they're going to really make a, a go here. And both those guys, Okami and Balharis, mm -hmm. are fighting on this card. Both of their releases from the UFC were very big news stories. We talked about them at length on this very show. Do you think this will translate into a big number? Is this a big deal for WSOF, especially if Paul Harris does fight? 
Well, part of the reason that those guys are who they are is because they were they were behind the promotion machine of the UFC, but at the same time, they were going up against guys we'd heard of. Mm. You know, who is Yushin Okama fighting this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> Let me check. I think it's on my, my phone. The, the bigger issue is that Yushin Okami is not being the most exciting. He's had some. He's had pockets here and there. The uh, I remember the Evan Tanner one. Things like he's had some mm -hmm. moments where it's like he's really showed himself to be good, but. Uh, for the most part, you know, people are just bad mouth them, Yushin Okami, about not being a very exciting fight. And then he's fighting somebody you never heard of, and it becomes a, a different thing. Uh, to me, it's like it's still the matchups. You know, the, the, you got to have intrigue in the fights themselves. Um, I know that you can't just do that overnight. It's good to have one piece of the puzzle in there. But you know, obviously, if uh, if John Fitch and him could fight each other, and find a weight class or something, that might be that might hold some more um, intrigue. A guy like Carl against you know against Paul Harris. I just I, I think we still don't know much about Carl. I mean, he beat Berkman, who was on that role, but at the same time, I don't think he generates that buzz himself. You know, just by himself. So it's like that conflict. Like I was saying, Askren would have had that. I feel like that would have been something that they could have put together. But to me, it's just the matchups right now are just not there. The thing about Paul Harris that's sort of cool though is that, you know, we talk about him as a as a UFC cast off, but he was cast off not because he was on a losing streak. He was he was cast off after a really really impressive yeah. victory. So. So, you know, he's a guy that, in a sense, is on an upward spiral mm -hmm. in terms of competition. Well, the, the moments after the competition, if he only can, you know, we can erase that part, those two or three seconds after sure. the competition, it'd be a whole different story. So, I mean, you know, Okami not the same way. You know, Okami sort of reached his, his ceiling, but his ceiling was pretty high. You know, he wasn't losing against, uh, against bums. So, you know, both these guys have, have some, but you're right, There's, you do need to have the, you know, you need the other guy, the other, the other part of the... Of the, and, of the and unfortunately, it works against World Series of Fighting a little bit, the fact that neither of them is, are, are English speakers, mm -hmm. right? So, like, right. as far as the promotion of the fights, um, the, the opponents would either have to do speaking for them or, or the, 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 the promotion needs to get the word out there in some way. Neither of those guys are, as you said, you know, uh, Paras is kind of a soft-spoken guy. Okami was never known for being a great <laughs> yeah. quote either. So, unfortunately, <laughs> there's not, not a lot they can do to build, like, the intrigue of what these fights are and what they mean and, and, all, and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So... That that's a big problem for them too, as far as like you know promoting the card. I don't. What, what is a great number for you? Like, is this gonna? Well, what's a great number? It would for be nice for them to kind of break through from that. I think 200, 250 Yeah, it, it's tough, man. It's it's March Here. Madness Saturday it night. Um, it's, At least it's a not, tough like, MMA side of things. There aren't you know there's no yeah. UFCs yeah. going in. So. Which nice brings me thing. to my last yeah. quick point here before we go. It, it's a rare non UFC weekend, and uh, <laughs> it, it's one for the World Series of Fightings to. Uh, showcase their talent. Also, there's Bellator on, on Friday as their season continues and their middleweight champion, Alexander Shlomenko, uh, defends and hopefully his young daughter is there as well celebrating with <laughs> yeah. him. I, the, the, the best father Smart in MMA, life. without a doubt. Uh, I, I love that ongoing storyline. And then there's uh, Metamorris, which isn't an MMA uh, event necessarily, but there are certainly some, some connections there, some familiar names like Babalu, Vinny Magalhães. Luke isn't here. I was going to say, I was going to pop up over <laughs> yeah, That's right. Break <laughs> through the door. Um, if you had to pick one, which which card intrigues you the, mo the most? Maybe none of them. But if you had to pick one in this non-UFC weekend, which one yeah, are you, Mike, what you, you most on. interested in? It's March Madness and my UConn Huskies are playing. Fair enough. I'll be watching basketball. Um, yeah. That's a, yeah. That's your answer. I, no, be, I, I, will tape, I will tape both MMA cards and watch them later, but I'll be watching basketball. No interest in the uh, jiu-jitsu? Sport you Bravo. No. Bravo versus uh, Gracie, the big. Uh, no, the big I'll, 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 I'll check out the result the next day. I, Jeff? I, I sort of, it's almost like we were talking about the. Uh, about Paharis and being a you know interesting fighter, but the but the kind of hype around it is not is not there. Well, you know I like to watch that fight just for the competition of it, but I have an interest in Metamoris um, almost from the opposite side. But I don't really, you know, I'm not somebody who sit, sits and watch uh, watches uh, sports jujitsu very much. But but it's interesting, you know. You got on the one hand you've got a, a member of the Gracie family, so this is like you know. Um, I, actually, I was trying to write something for Sai about this, and I was I was trying to you know cast them in, in, in who they what characters they might be, and I was thinking that you know Gracie would be like you know uh, John Quincy Adams. He comes from like a family that was that was that was a, 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 a founding a founding family of the sport. You know, like well, yeah, like, you yeah. know, we're really part of the founders of the sport. And on the other hand. You know, you've got um, you, you got a guy who's like the Timothy Leary of the sport. Yeah. You know, the other side <laughs> of it. And so, you know, if you're if you put it in that and way, and it's a rematch. Yeah. And it's a rematch. It's great. So you got Timothy Leary against John Quincy Adams. How can you not watch that? <laughs> I'm in. I was, what were you I, doing I was at the time you came up with this, Jeff? <laughs> Can't wait to read that. Okay, more Timothy Leary than, than John Quincy Adams. Chuck. 
I was at the last Metamorphosis. Uh, it was uh, a oh, very. Say, I, I was at the last John Quincy Adams. Film. <laughs> yeah, I was at the last John Quincy. No, but I was, was at the, the last Metamorphosis, and it was very interesting to me just uh, how the crowd was so different from a UFC crowd that they, they, the, you know, it's all about the ground game. They could anticipate what was going on, so it'd be completely quiet in there, and then the crowd would swell up, you know, as soon as they saw something developing. It was really interesting. Um, having said all that, the, the the Bellator one for me is a little bit. I was at. I was also at the uh, the last Shamanko Cooper fight. They're not fighting each other, but those yeah. guys are in the same room. When they they put on such an epic fight that night at Mohegan Sun. Were you there at that one too? Uh, I don't remember, but <laughs> but uh, to me, the, you know, the, the, watching those guys fight, uh, it's after that, it's yeah. just it becomes something. It becomes like you remember that fight and you want to see them do it again. They're fighting. They both got interesting. And Brendan Ward, that should be a pretty yeah. good fight for Shemaine. Kendall Grove and Kendall Grove also yeah. trying to resurrect his career, so he's also fighting. You on guys the enjoy the shows. They're all yeah. good. They're I mean, well. really, why not? Well, I mean, I I think this is part of it. We we you know, we were. We always talk about you know there, there being oversaturation of MMA, yeah. but you guys still can't get enough. We can, I can't get enough. It's weird. I'm like, how am I gonna I watch can. all this stuff? I can. Sometimes when you have a lot of white meat, you want some dark meat but, as well. But it's, <laughs> also, it's also about you know sometimes it's, some, part sometimes it's about more than the uh, it's about more than the sort of the, the glitter of it all. I mean, sure. we were talking before about you know what we're all working on, and I was working on a mailbag column. And I, you know, I get emails from all different people about all different kinds of topics. And one of them I got in there was someone saying, you know, since it's an off week this this weekend, and I was like, I use that just that one line from the, from the email because it isn't an off week. It just seems like an off week to so many people because the major league of MMA is not in competition. But like Chuck's right, that the Bellator card could be a lot of fun, even if you don't know all the fighters that are on there. They if they match them up right, it could be a lot of fun. The same with the World Series of Fighting. And you know, and of course, you know, Timothy Leary against John. Quincy. <laughs> we had, I love the analogies this week. John Quincy Adams on this side, <laughs> chicken. On yeah. This side. Do we need to explain who and, those and, people are? By and, and how about we, this? Anybody know who the those beat are? goes on, right? As I think Jack Carrick once said. No, yeah. maybe. No, I'm not sure. The beat next, right? Well, anyway, I don't think he actually said that. I think it was the great Wayne Finley who's going on his, uh, his <laughs> voyage. <laughs> <laughs> Whole voyage to him. The beat goes on, my friends. It is a uh, a very busy weekend, a non UFC weekend, but still a very busy weekend in the world of mixed martial arts and combat sports. Let us know what you'll be watching this weekend in the comment section below. Let us know what you thought about anything we talked about on the show today. And of course, we'll be back next week for a brand new episode of the MMA Beat. For Mike, Jeff, Chuck, I'm Ariel. Thank you so much for watching the show right here on MMAfighting.com. We'll see you next week. <laughs>